everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. The topic for this webinar is Residential Solar Financing 101. And our host for this webinar is Nate Hausman. Nate is a project manager at the Clean Energy States Alliance, also known as CESA. This webinar is a presentation of the Sustainable Solar Education Project, which is managed by CESA and supported by the U.S. Department of Energy's SunShot Initiative. And before I turn it over to Nate, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our participants for this webinar are in listen-only mode. That means that you can hear us, hopefully, but we can't hear you. You have a couple of options to connect to the audio portion of the webinar. You can either call in using your telephone, or you can connect using your computer mic and speakers. We have a very important note. Uh, please submit your questions throughout the webinar as you think of them by typing them into the question box on your webinar console and hitting send. We will be reading through your questions as you send them in. We will get to as many questions as we can at the end of our presentation. We'll try to save some time for a Q&A, 15 or 20 minutes or so. So please get your questions in. Um, the sooner you get them in, the better chance you have of getting them answered. Finally, uh, this webinar is being recorded. You'll find a recording of this webinar on our website at cesa.org backslash webinars, and we'll also email you a copy within about 24 hours following the webinar. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to our host for this webinar, Nate Hausman. Great. Thanks, Samantha. Um, and before I turn things over to, to Travis Ladder from NREL um, to talk about residential solar financing, I just want to tell you a little bit about who we are at CESA and the Sustainable Solar Education Project that, that we're embarking on. The Clean Energy States Alliance, or CESA, as we're known, is a national nonprofit network of public agencies and organizations working together to advance clean energy. We're made up of mostly state agencies, and you can see our many members on this slide. Financing is one of the policy areas that CESA works in, and that's what we're going to tackle today, uh, residential solar financing. I also want to let you know that we published a short guidebook on this topic for consumers last year. The guidebook is called A Homeowner's Guide to Solar Financing. You can download it for free from CESA's website at www.cesa.org. That's C-E-S-A.org. Great. Next. Excellent. CESA recently launched a project called the Sustainable Solar Education Project. The project is designed to, to help state and municipal officials ensure that distributed solar electricity remains consumer friendly and benefits low and moderate income households. We think that both these issues that we'll be focused on, uh, solar consumer protection and solar equitability, are important for the solar market sustained long-term growth. And both issues are implicated under today's topic of residential solar financing. Through the solar, excuse me, through the Sustainable Solar Education Project, we're developing a variety of educational resources for state and municipal officials on topics related to consumer protection and solar equitability. The resources include program guides, webinars, online course material, in-person trainings, and a monthly newsletter, uh, which will include project announcements, news items, and updates. For more information on the Sustainable Solar Education Project or to sign up for our project's monthly newsletter, you can visit CESA's website, and you can see CESA's website on the screen there. Okay, well, with that, let me introduce to you Travis Lauder, who will talk to you about solar financing. Travis Lauder is a, a, is a renewable energy analyst at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, in Golden, Colorado. His research centers on solar PV finance and financial innovations, market analysis, and renewable energy policy. He also works directly with municipal governments, universities, tribal nations, and other public and private institutions on technical, assistant, technical assistance matters related to PV economics, tax implications, capacity building, and training. Travis holds an MA in International Development from the University of Denver, Denver and a BA in English from the University of Colorado. Take it away, Travis. Thanks, Nate. Um, Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining today, and, and thanks to CESA for uh, putting this on. Um, we're going to sort of cover a very uh, high-level overview of the residential solar financing space today, um, kind of at a brisk trot, because um, some of these issues have some more uh, in-depth complexities um, that uh, certainly bear discussion, but uh, we won't necessarily touch on today for, for want of time. 
Um, my email is at the end of the presentation, um, so I encourage anyone to follow up with me afterward, and um, uh, certainly we can use the Q&A at the end of the, uh, the presentation to um, cover any uh, ground that uh, you're all curious about that we didn't cover here. So uh, just to get things started, get set up here. So uh, to give you some context, this is the, um, the growth trend for residential PV uh, over the last 10 years, um, ending in 2015. Um, we are currently in the hockey stick moment uh, for residential PV. It's been growing since 2005 at about 55% per year at a compound annual growth rate. That's about 77 times uh, where it started in 2005. Um, uh, sometime in February, the United States installed its one millionth system, and uh, sometime right around now, if it hasn't happened already, the millionth residential system uh, will be, be going on a rooftop in the United States. Um, and it took us 40 years to get to that point. It will probably only take us another couple of years to double those numbers. So um, things are uh, looking pretty bright right now, uh, at least for the uh, horizon of the uh, tax credit. Uh, for solar in the U.S. There are some other challenges, some headwinds that we'll sort of talk about a little later in the presentation having to do with changing rate structures, et cetera, um, but we'll get there. Uh, right now, the U.S. is kind of a lumpy market. Most of the growth is consolidated in certain states. I've listed the top ones here, um, but 80 to 90 percent of uh, residential growth in, in the United States, residential solar growth, is um, confined to the top 10 states. So these states are usually ones that have a um, combination of uh, beneficial resources or, or high solar insulation, um, incentives available to uh, homeowners that install these systems or the, or the third party companies that, that will do so, and um, consumer interest and a variety of other factors generally. Um, but uh, as we see costs come down, and uh, electricity rates um, uh, continue to rise. We are noticing that uh, solar is becoming available in, in more states, um, so that's a trend we're all sort of keeping our eye on. Um, and again, this is going to depend on um, the future of rate structures, so um, everyone's kind of watching with bated breath how these factors play out. So what's fueling all this growth, this hockey stick growth that I mentioned before? Uh, this third bullet, or excuse me, fourth bullet here, economics, is the primary reason at present. Um, you, you'll notice this chart I've got at the bottom here, which uh, is sort of a conceptualized uh, market adoption curve. Uh, this is, we're, we're now past the early adopter phase for PV. You had folks uh, be, uh, going solar in the, uh, in the early years of, um, of the tax credit availability uh, for um, environmental reasons, uh, taking control of their generation, right, this, this whole prosumer idea. Um, these were sort of non-economic considerations that were fueling early stage growth. Um, but now that um, solar has become an economic choice for a lot of consumers and, and rates where electricity uh, rates are high um, or high enough where solar can compete, um, you notice that we've crossed this chasm here uh, listed on the, on the chart. And we're into this sort of early majority pragmatist phase where um, people who are aware of the product, who are a little more savvy maybe than these uh, so-called late majority conservatives, um, are, are adopting PV um, as an economic choice um, to reduce electricity bills, to hedge against rate increases um, from the utility, uh, various sorts of things to, to save themselves money. Um, so now that we're at this stage, we have a variety of financing options available. Um, Third-party finance, I'm sure most of you on the call are aware of what this is and um, generally aware about its, its various features, um, and we'll discuss those in, in just a minute here. Uh, but that was sort of a principal means of driving growth in the, the PV, uh, residential PV sector specifically, um, and, and considerable growth in, in commercial as well. Um, this is something that became available 2006-2007-ish with the, um, the advent of Solar City and, uh, and Sunrun, and then some other companies um, came in just a bit after that. 
and um, it allowed folks to go solar for no money down and um, to realize uh, instant savings on their electricity bill. And uh, this was uh, in, in areas like California where state incentives were pretty robust and um, uh, you could get uh, not only uh, good bang for your buck for the RECs, but for also uh, the, the uh, production-based incentives to the, the California Solar Initiative. Um, you saw a lot of residential growth there. This growth helped sort of um, develop supply chains, um, create standards. Essentially, we watched a market mature around this product um, and costs continue to decline, costs for modules and, and installation, et cetera. And uh, now we're at this point where costs are such that um, solar makes sense in a lot more markets. Um, and TPO is still the um, third-party ownership, still the dominant uh, financing product available to consumers today, although um, the balance may be shifting um, as we speak toward uh, more host ownership options like loans. Um, I include cash purchase here on the, on the consumer financing menu, even though it's not a financing option. It is um, a way to go solar today that makes m more sense now than ever uh, because of the declining costs of installation and, and equipment. Uh, but again, um, it does require a, a significant capital outlay, um, and this is something that uh, maybe most homeowners, homeowners don't have access to. Um, so today, when uh, you're looking at uh, where consumers are going solar, you see um, a good mix of third-party ownership and loans. Um, and you see there's uh, several different types within each, and I'll discuss those momentarily. But first, just wanted to give a sense of um, market share for these third-party finance providers. Um, the top installers um, over the last several years have comprised over half of the market. Um, this doesn't mean uh, exclusively TPO products. Um, all the uh, major uh, TPO companies now offer loans. Um, Solar City actually just revamped theirs and, and re-released it last month. Um, and uh, although some of them, uh, like Vivint, haven't necessarily had any major press release surrounding their loan product, they do sort of quietly offer one. Um, so there are some loans um, kind of uh, shuffled in under the, into these numbers, but um, just to give you a sense of the dominance of TPO over the last several years, the loan phenomenon wasn't until 2014, really, and um, I think the last figures I saw for the for the market penetration for uh, TPO to to other products is around 60 to 70 percent. It's kind of a shifting target. You know, so many residential systems go in um, in in a in a day that uh, it'll it'll move um, quite frequently within the span of a, a couple of months. But um, I think 60 to 70 percent is sort of a fair estimate of where we are today for market share of uh, third-party products to loans. Um, and again, uh, a lot of analysts see that balance shifting more towards uh, loan products uh, where the host will actually own the system. So uh, just an overview of how these third-party uh, products generally work. Um, again, these are all company-specific products. So um, the, the bullet points you see here are, are generalized, not specific to any one of them. Um, but you'll find uh, these in, uh, in a lot of the contracts. Um, and then there are some uh, more idiosyncratic elements you might find in contracts. But generally today, we're getting to a point where the third-party finance market um, has uh, achieved a degree of standard standardization uh, that allows homeowners to shop uh, pretty intelligently uh, between companies uh, without getting sort of caught up on, on contract terms. They can shop more on price and, and maybe uh, and brand and things like that. So in a third-party product, a third-party owned system. Obviously, uh, the TPO provider owns the system. The homeowner does not. Um, we'll get into things like liens and, and UCC filings just a little bit later. Um, these are typically, the, the majority of these are 20-year contracts, um, and they do escalate often unless um, the, uh, uh, the homeowner will put down some money uh, at the contract signing date to, to remove that escalator. But generally, we see these things escalate at 2.9%, and it, it varies per market, uh, per per deal, uh, really. So 2.9% um, was a standard a couple of years ago. Um, that might be sort of what you're seeing today. But again, uh, it could be highly variable based on, on several other factors. 
In a lease, uh, you are paying a flat monthly rate for the so for use of the solar system on on the rooftop. Uh, that monthly rate stays the same for 12 months and then will escalate by that uh, percentage um, year over year. The PPA is a per kilowatt hour charge, so you're buying energy, you're buying electricity, essentially. Um, these PPAs help consumers uh, shop against their utility rate a little more effectively so that they can sort of see where their, uh, where their PPA uh, offer rate from the TPO provider matches up against their volumetric charge for their utility rate. Helps them sort of get an idea of how much they'll be saving on a direct apples to apples basis. Um, these PPA kilowatt per kilowatt hour charges do escalate year over year as well, just the same as the lease. Um, generally in both the lease and the PPA you will have a production guarantee. Um, in, the, in the PPA, uh, this is something you're going to want to make sure is in your contract because if your system underproduces one month um, and you don't achieve the kind of savings that you thought you would, um, then you're going to want to ensure that you're protected somehow. You're indemnified against a low level of production, right? If it's an excessively cloudy month or something like that when it should have been sunny. Um, generally, operations and maintenance, that's the O&M there, is covered by the TPO provider. It's their system. They will service it. Um, they will uh, swap out the inverter at year 10, um, et cetera, and um, you know, monitor produ production. And, and do all these things. So it's kind of uh, generally hassle-free for, um, for homeowners. And, and this is just some color commentary. One of the reasons why these TPO products were such a, a boon for the solar industry uh, a few years back is because it was sort of hassle-free solar. You can go solar for zero money down. You could uh, very possibly undercut your utility rate, make some savings on your electricity bill, and um, the TPO provider would service it. It was kind of a, a hassle-free uh, grease the skids kind of transaction. So it worked out for a lot of folks. Um, generally these contracts, these third-party contracts will offer an option to purchase either sometime during the contract term or um, you have the option to purchase after the contract is up. Um, in addition to a purchase after the contract is up, um, there is an option to have the uh, solar company come and remove the system uh, or you can re-sign, you can re-up your contract. Uh, the you know while we don't necessarily know the lifetime of these systems, uh, most of the systems, the vast majority um, are are less than you know half a decade old, um, both in the residential and the utility space. Uh, we're seeing um, we we do reasonably anticipate that these systems ha are long lived, that they will go past the twenty year contract and and still uh, continue to produce energy at at a meaningful clip. So. Um, I guess we'll kind of uh, encounter what happens at the end of these contracts as we get there. But as it stands, we're, we're uh, in the early phases of, of how these things are playing out. So there's no sort of um, data on what uh, consumers are doing at the end of their contracts and how these systems are performing. Um, one of the things that folks should be aware of in these TPO contracts is that the, um, the provider, um, the company that owns the system, retains the right to reasonable access to the roof. Um, it's not necessarily an easement or anything like that, but it's it's something that uh, homeowners should be aware of, that uh, this system is on the roof and um, they could very well have folks coming over to, you know, check it out and, and walk on the roof and all these things. But generally in these contracts there is um, some agreement that the roof warranty won't be violated. So uh, there's there's no um, no major concerns there unless the roof is in poor condition or in, in, in general you'll be told at that point, but um, also if you're working with a contractor that doesn't have such a great reputation um, or that, you know, is uh, somehow deserving of investigation, then you might want to check that out. Um, these contractors, um, I should mention that uh, third-party financing uh, often has a, uh, a channel network, uh, so you have your vertically inter integrated providers like Solar City. Solar City will do everything from the financing to the installation um, to the O&M, um, but you also have other companies that will, uh, for example, Spruce Financial, um, they'll do the financing, um, but they contract out installation and O&M to uh, third parties, and they generally have a rigorous uh, process for qualifying contractors, so um, there's that first line of defense, you know, for homeowners there. But um, again, 
you always want to know who you're dealing with in terms of a contractor. Um, consumers should do their own homework, um, and we'll sort of touch on that when we get to the area, uh, the slide on consumer protection just a bit here. So loan products, the solar secured loan was something that was new just a couple of years ago. Um, SunGage Financial uh, was uh, the first company to, uh, to offer this product on the market. They uh, had a, a public-private partnership with um, the Green Bank of Connecticut, which was known as um, Cephia at the time. They were uh, underwriting these loans um, in Connecticut specifically. Uh, they've since grown uh, to uh, the Massachusetts market and several, several others. They're based in Massachusetts, but they're now operational in, in several states. Um, but this solar secured loan is a loan that is, um, just as it says, secured to the solar system. So the lender will um, issue an amount uh, that will cover the cost of installation and equipment um, and uh, will uh, maintain a security interest in the system. It is not a security interest in the home. It's not a lien on the home. Um, there's a lot of confusion about this right now. Um, I think some of that confusion is getting clarified as solar gets bigger and uh, more mortgage lenders um, and title companies are coming in contact with it. Uh, but in general, um, the security interest is just in the system. The UCC filing is just to uh, note record of a lien on the system. Um, so the loan goes to um, usually the contractor to cover the costs of installation in the system. Uh, we've seen loan terms in the market from 10 to 20 years, um, so it can compete with uh, TPO products on that on that length of contract there. If that's what folks want, if they want a low monthly payment to draw out um, the contract is the best way to do that. Uh, we've seen loan terms as short as five years and some even longer. Solar City offered a product which was a 30-year product until uh, recently. They, they removed that product from the market a few months back. but. Um, I think the idea there was that you're sort of matching terms with a mortgage at that point. Um, interest rates range from 2.99 to 8% plus. Um, those are going to be variable based on a host of factors. One is uh, customer risk, right? So you'll have your FICO-based pricing. Um, you'll, you'll do your basic underwriting, you know, when was the customer's last bankruptcy? Um, have they ever, or excuse me, uh, when was, have they ever had a bankruptcy? What's their debt to, or, uh, debt to income ratio? Um, things like that. Um, these 2.99% interest rates are generally something you see when um, the uh, installer will uh, buy down the interest rate. That's that next bullet, um, the interest rate buy down from the contractor. Generally, they'll contribute some capital to reduce that interest rate, um, and that, that might get folded into the cost of the system. So while you may be getting a lower interest rate, the system costs may be higher. So they may be financing a higher, um, a higher price, which, um, you know, you have to do some math there to determine whether or not you're getting the best deal. In these systems, because the or in, in a loan finance system, because the host owns it, they will claim the ITC and the RECs generally. Um, usually, to finance this, uh, the ITC amount that the that the homeowner will be receiving at the end of the tax year, they will do a special sort of same as cash loan. Um, a lot of these uh, loan providers will do a zero percent interest loan for 12 to 18 months, and then you essentially, um, you will pay that down all in one fell swoop in a balloon payment um, at the time that you receive your ITC at the end of the tax year or just a little bit afterward. So that helps you to buy down essentially that 30% of the system um, that the ITC uh, will, uh, will go toward. Um, I should also say, just for context, you do have a number of players in this market uh, underwriting loans. You have your finance companies, uh, which include your solar companies um, like SolarCity, et cetera, that offer loans, Spruce Financial. Um, but you also have credit unions, which are depository institutions, and you also have some banks. Now, uh, credit unions and banks being um, depository institutions that have federal insurance uh, have are subject to regulators. And the regulators have a say over what kind of terms they can offer on these loans, particularly how far out they can go and you know, how they can match that portfolio of loans against their capital requirements, et cetera. So um, oftentimes credit unions and banks may not be able to offer the same kind of terms as a, uh, as a finance company, which are not regulated at the federal level but are subject to state uh, regulations. So that's just something to be aware of as a, as a consumer, as a shopper 
for these loan products, you know, what kind of product do you want, what makes the most sense for you as a homeowner, and, and for monthly payments, for lifetime costs, et cetera, um, and what kind of lender can provide that for you. NREL did an analysis a couple of years back. Um, I was a co-author on this report with uh, David Fellman. Um, this was to do an economic assessment of how loans stacked up against TPO. Um, we sort of arrived at the conclusion based on the assumptions that I've listed here that uh, the loan product offered the best levelized cost of energy, which is your cost of solar essentially, right? You can compare this to a PPA um, amount, a per kilowatt hour charge uh, from your utility rate. Um, so you were getting the best deal with uh, the shortest term loan even though, um, even if your price per uh, kilowatt hour was the lowest for the shortest term loan, your monthly payment was the highest. The advantage comes when you, um, when your payments drop off after five years and you're essentially getting free electricity on the back, you know, 15 to plus years of your, of your uh, solar system. I believe this was a 30 year analysis, so um, you were getting 25 years of free electricity. Um, that degraded just as by a small amount year over year. So you get the best cost of energy for the short-term loan, but again, you're, you're sort of, you're ramping your payments, so you're paying a high amount in the early years. So you're not necessarily capturing economics immediately, um, or favorable economics immediately. You're getting that all on the back end, but it's a long back end. So, um, you know, that while that may not be the best choice for um, consumers, even the 20-year loan beat, up, beat, uh, beat out the 20-year uh, the PPA, Again, highly dependent on assumptions and the way this economic analysis was done. Um, but I should mention that sort of the principal factor that you want to consider when um, you're uh, considering a loan versus a PPA is that in a PPA or a lease, you will be um, paying toward the company uh, that is providing the loan or lease. You're paying towards their cost of capital, whatever that is. Generally, that's high-risk capital. Um, it's it's um, Oftentimes, um, I, I, won't, I won't give percentages because it's a moving target, differs for every company, but it, it may be higher than the comparative interest rate on your loan. In a, in, a, in a loan situation, that interest rate is based off of, you know, your risk as a customer and some other factors that uh, the, uh, the financier will build in, the lender will build in. So um, if you're comparing those two percentages, oftentimes the, um, the loan interest rate percentage will beat out the, uh, the cost of capital that you have to um, essentially help the, uh, the third-party company finance. So that's the big difference. Um, you're helping them sort of earn their returns um, as opposed to um, earning your own return. So um, the general perception is that loans, um, on economic grounds and on uh, non-economic grounds, such as you know, you get this self-determination of ownership, uh, you get to claim the ITC, all of these things. Um, that loans have a pretty uh, favorable bearing against third-party products, even though uh, we haven't quite seen a massive uptake of loans in the market, um, and that could be due to several reasons, including education, availability, and other things. I'll just really quickly uh, sort of trot through this uh, property assessed clean energy slide. Uh, this is sort of a, another beast unto itself, uh, even though it is somewhat of a loan product. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a special tax assessment uh, on a property. And that tax assessment, which goes towards financing um, energy upgrades and retrofits, uh, gets dispersed in the amount of a loan. And that either goes uh, to the contractor or to the, uh, the property owner. And um, that finances the installation of these energy retrofits and upgrades, that loan is then repaid via the property tax bill. Um, so there's no uh, separate bill. Um, you do still get an interest rate on this capital, and that interest rate can um, generally be a little higher than some of the interest rates you see on loan products in the marketplace. Um, but the benefit there is that, again, you're not getting a separate bill. And um, it is uh, for investors in, in PACE, um, that are buying these things either as securities or that are contributing capital to be uh, lent out um, to, um, to finance these upgrades. The, um, the, the benefit is that the assessment stays with the property. So whoever owns that property is, is staying current, and if they're not staying current, if they get foreclosed or if they sell, the next owner 
we'll uh, bring the payments up to current, and then we'll resume things from there. So there's always sort of not, a, if not a guarantee of payment, it's it's a it's a pretty good, uh, pretty um, secure arrangement. Um, and this allows for some subprime uh, FICO underwriting, right? Because the um, the loan itself is not tied to the system. There's no uh, technology risk or performance risk or anything like that. It's just it's paying your property taxes, um, which is a pretty low risk kind of thing. Um, so uh, not only can you underwrite, um, you, know, you can dig into the lower FICO bands, which is uh, good. It's a uh, it's sort of a, a methodology for uh, tapping the LMI community, uh, low to moderate income community. Um, and uh, it allows for credit enhancements on things like securitizations, right? So you can finance this, these loans, refinance these loans in the in the capital markets, and um, and bring it in at a lower cost capital, um, you know, because you get a higher credit rating for the uh, for the qualities of the tax assessment. Now, um, it's as you all probably know, the uh, the controversy surrounding residential pace is ongoing. It's just been quiet for a couple of years. So while it does exist, and while you're you're seeing a great deal of underwritings in California, or excuse me, um, pace assessments being levied in California, and in a, a couple other markets, uh, the FHFA position is still unclear. So there's still a good um, deal of uncertainty um, and uh, attendant risk around that. But um, it has not seemed to uh, be terribly um, effective at at uh, squelching the market in California. Um, so I think that um, there's uh, continued guidance that comes out. HUD has come out, and um, in favor of, of second lien pace, kind of a different product than than the, than the pace under or pace assessments we're seeing in the market now. Um, but uh, I think that guidance from the major housing uh, regulators will be forthcoming, and that's just something we'll all have to kind of sit tight for. In the meantime, these things are sort of. Uh, continuing a pace in in uh, California and uh, the other markets where it's available. Other types of financing available that you don't see too much of in the marketplace. Uh, you can certainly do a home equity loan or, or tap your line of credit if you uh, if you think that's uh, a good investment as a homeowner. Of course, there are competing investments for that capital, right? A vacation, for for example, or if you'd like to do some other upgrades to your home and you don't uh, want to tap. Um, you know other types of um, capital available from the the housing regulators, um, then you have to sort of consider whether solar is the best investment. Will will earn you the best return on your investment compared to say a kitchen upgrade or updating the exterior, etc. Um, there's FHFA or FHA, excuse me, insured financing available for solar and other energy upgrades like energy efficiency, etc. Um, 203k rehabilitation rehabilitation mortgages are available to finance solar. Um, these can be potentially a very good deal because you're rolling your solar loan into your mortgage. So not only do you have one payment, no separate payment for the solar, but it's also at the interest rate of your mortgage, which um, you know mortgages have been at historic lows for a number of years now. So this is something that homeowners uh, might want to take advantage of. Um, there's also, also the Fannie Mae Homestyle Energy um, Mortgage, which allows uh, for a similar uh, rolling into the mortgage to finance um, energy upgrades. Power Saver is a Title I product that's also FHA insured. Um, Power Saver allows for um, a $7,500 uh, unsecured loan to do energy upgrades and then uh, anything up between $7,500 and, and uh, $25,000 I believe is the cap um, is secured by the home. So it's essentially a second mortgage. Um, but you can get a decent interest rate on that as well. There are unsecured loans that you might get offered if you have a good relationship with your bank or credit union. They might do it as a one-off. Say, hey, you've been a customer with us for you know, 15 years. You've always uh, helped us, treated us well, et cetera. Um, we will um, underwrite you this special loan, and we'll give you this special interest rate, et cetera. Right? So that's relationship banking. Um, that's sort of not an official way to go about doing things, but if you have a great relationship with your bank, it's always worth um, checking it out with them. Um, you may have to educate them in that case, so the underwriting process may be long and you may not get the best deal, but um, we've heard of these things being done. Um, there's also on-bill recovery or on-bill financing that um, you can uh, you can do some energy upgrades to your home and get that secured to your utility bill. 
Um, and that is only available in certain places where um, it's essentially um, a public-private partnership. You need uh, the uh, public sector to move on the statute to allow for this sort of thing. And oftentimes you'll see these programs being administrated by uh, green banks or some other public institution. Um, sometimes we've seen them being uh, done by municipalities municipal utilities or cooperatives or, or you know, utilities that have smaller service territories and a little more contact with their customers, a little closer contact with their customers. Um, but uh, this can also be a, um, an economic way to go to install solar. Um, but I guess the point here is that the menu is quite extensive. Not everyone has options. Um, if you live in, say, Arkansas, you may not have any of them. Um, but so you might need to consider a home equity loan or a special loan or something like that. You may not have a, the solar companies may not be active in your area um, and uh, you may not uh, have on bill, et cetera. So a lot of variability between region um, and state. Um, it's just something that consumers gonna, are going to have to be aware of and there are online resources, some of which I'll mention at the end, which can help them out. Um, moving into, I'm running out of time here if we want to get to questions, so I'll kind of I'll move quickly. but. Right now, um, I started this presentation saying solar is on a tear, residential solar is on a tear. Um, the economics are favorable in a lot of markets. GTM published a report recently that said that uh, maybe it was 20-some state markets are at or approaching grid parity. Um, but that takes into account a couple things. One, um, the, uh, the ITC uh, is still available to uh, residential solar, both uh, for uh, corporations and for individuals. Um, and that certainly helps a great deal. That helps keep costs low for, um, you know, if you're looking at this on a per kilowatt hour uh, basis. And uh, additionally, right now we have net metering in a lot of markets at the retail rate. And, uh, and rate structures are primarily, uh, utility rate structures are primarily geared towards volumetric charges. So these conditions have all contributed to a healthy development for solar, but uh, as utilities have watched uh, solar gain uh, greater market penetration, greater penetration on the grid, they have sort of changed their stance as to how they would like to uh, operate the grid and how they uh, regard uh, solar generation and how they would like to charge their customers, et cetera. So, you know, if we're, if we're transitioning to a prosumer economy, how will our rate structures change uh, accordingly? So you've already had some filings in um, places like Arizona. Uh, the California uh, PUC has already uh, mandated uh, a transition for um, solar customers to get to time of use rates. Um, we are seeing sort of various proposals as to how to deal with the increased uh, grid penetration of solar. Time of use rates is one of them. So essentially instead of paying a volumetric charge per kilowatt hour charge, um, which is the comprised of the majority of a customer's bill. Uh, you might have a um, per kilowatt hour charge that isn't flat but reflects um, what it costs the utility to procure that power at a certain time of day. So during peak times, you will see uh, time of use uh, volumetric charges uh, are higher than at uh, the shoulders of the day when, when demand is lower. Um, and uh, net metering might get compensated at that rate as well. But if you are not, if you are generating most of your electricity before peak usage, your um, the uh, compensation for your solar generator is going to be lower. And then the uh, when you get home, turn your lights on, you know, start dinner, turn the TV on, etc. Your usage and therefore what you're paying is going to be higher. Your solar generation is not offsetting that as much. It could be a mismatch between what people are used to in terms of the um, historic net metering relationship. Or, or arrangement uh, that they that, uh, most cus customers are used to having. Uh, demand charges is also something that um, has been discussed by utilities and and uh, regulators. Um, this is essentially a sort of 10 to or 15 to 30 minute window uh, where the highest demand occurs on a monthly basis, and uh, customers get charged on a uh, uh, per kilowatt. Uh, capacity-based charge for that. Um, and solar uh, without storage uh, has a hard time um, 
reliably uh, offsetting demand charges. This is something we see as a challenge in the commercial space because commercial customers are often subject to demand charges. It's not something you see in the residential space a whole lot. Customers will sometimes opt for it um, if it's available, but there are, as I understand it at this point, no mandated demand charges on any um, uh, major IOUs in the U.S., um, but that's something that could change. Uh, we're also seeing some uh, fixed charges, which are uh, charges that are flat imposed on every bill, um, and uh, those can also eat at the economics of a solar installation, right? Because if you're offsetting your volumetric charges, which is comprises the majority of your bill, um, fixed charges uh, are not offset by the solar. So you might be reducing your solar bill, but the fixed charge stays sort of stubbornly at its at its uh, uh, level, and if you increase those fixed charges, then um, you are eroding further into the economics of a, of a solar installation. We're also seeing uh, minimum bills uh, proposed. Uh, these are uh, bills that can't, uh, even if you uh, wipe out all of your generation um, or offset all of your generation in a month with a solar installation, a minimum bill would still come to you at you know, 10 to $15 or whatever the rate happens to be. Um, so similar to fixed charges um, in that respect. Um, net energy metering is also changing. changing. We're seeing uh, various proposals as to how to do that. In Minnesota, we've seen a value of solar tariff adopted. This is basically valuing the solar generation um, as to what it's worth to the utility and grid services and then paying the generator that rate. Uh, we're also seeing just a uh, slash in the in generator compensation. This has happened in Hawaii. Uh, this is in a proposal in various places currently as well. Um, and then compensation based on time of use as well, which if, you're, if your peak demand doesn't line up with your peak usage, or excuse me, if your peak usage doesn't wind up or line up with your peak solar generation, um, then this is something we're going to see as being um, sort of detrimental to the economics of solar without further changes. Um, real quickly, I know we're uh, sort of bumping up on time for question here, but um, discussing the uh, disposition of the solar assets related to the home, this is a lot of interest, particularly to mortgage bankers um, and the solar industry. They, they want to get the message out to solar the, to the mortgage bankers and others, title companies, et cetera, and homeowners, that um, the uh, solar system uh, is generally not, um, there's no lien on the home when it gets installed. Uh, usually there's a security interest uh, UCC1 filed at the county and state level to uh, note record of lien on the system itself. This does not impede a home sale, although oftentimes um, we'll have, solar companies will have title companies call them up and say, hey, you need to remove your title. We've got a home sale going on um, in the next you know, 24 to 48 hours, and your lien impedes title. And the solar company uh, can't convince the title company that it's not a, a, an, an impediment on title, um, so they end up having to remove it, which is um, a significant cost. They have to file a UCC to remove the UCC-1, then they have to refile the UCC-1 um, to get to uh, keep the solar system on the roof. Um, and sometimes these costs get passed on to the, um, the person that assumes the contract for the solar system. Sometimes they don't. So this is a, uh, an issue that um, everybody would like to see fixed, including the you know, solar industry, um, certainly, but also mortgage bankers. They want to have clarity on what these assets mean. Um, title company uh, doesn't want to have these sort of uh, fire drill calls where they're having to um, ask the solar company to remove the, the record of lien. Um, these happen generally in uh, home sales, refinancings, and, and uh, foreclosures. Um, there are some sort of uh, differences between each of those processes. I won't go into how each one of them differs, but um, in general, uh, in a you can have the option in a any one of those sort of events, those credit events, let's call them, to transfer the contract if there's a, a buyer lined up. Um, the existing homeowner can pay down the contract, and sometimes they might be able to roll that into the, um, you know, their uh, their home price. Um, these UCC refiling fees might get passed on to the the next consumer. Um, also, uh, we've heard a lot about how uh, lease systems, TPO systems, 
uh, may be sort of they may slow down the home process, home sale process. They may actually um, uh, count as a uh, they may be a reduction in the home value. Um, that this was sort of the thinking of the housing regulators at one point of Fannie and Freddie when they issued their um, their their appraiser guidance. They they said there uh, were reductions attendant to uh, third party systems. Some of that information has been clarified. Um, I will say that current research, and it's, and it's ongoing, and most of this is uh, happening through um, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs releases these Selling Into the Sun reports and Appraising in the Sun reports, which is sort of the, um, the latest thinking on it, on the issue. Um, the host-owned systems, uh, there's a clear statistically significant uh, evidence um, that um, host-owned systems will contribute premiums to home values that these things will sell to premiums in markets where uh, people understand the asset. In lease systems, the jury's still out. They're still doing uh, the research. Uh, at this point, I believe that research is, um, they are conducting statistical analysis, but they've also done some surveys. And in general, the surveys seem to be favorable as to how lease systems interact with the home. You know, they certainly uh, won't uh, disadvantage the home in terms of a sale. Um, all the time, or I guess the majority of cases, uh, they do add to um, home value, and they are uh, they are seen by home buyers as as a uh, as an asset. But this happens in markets where solar is fairly well known, like San Diego. So um, again, uh, we're still waiting for for guidance on that on how lease systems affect home sales. Uh, my last slide here is on consumer protection. Um, I don't necessarily have time to go over right now if I want to make room for questions, uh, but uh, most of the information that I was going to discuss is sort of written out here, and and um, the CESA project uh, is uh, primarily concerned with cons consumer protection, so I would just um, stay involved with this, uh, this solar education project to uh, get all the issues on consumer protection as it relates to residential solar financing, and um, and Certainly, you can follow up with me afterwards, um, and I believe my email. Well, here are some resources uh, right there that will discuss some of these things. SIA has a whole consumer protection page, which is a great resource, and my email is right here. I'd be happy to answer questions or direct you further. Um, so, sorry for the quick finish, but to leave room for questions, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop it there. Great. Thanks much, Travis. You covered a, a lot of territory there. Um, we will move into, into questions, and we've got a slew of them. Um, so thanks for, thanks for providing questions. Um, we'll get to as many of them as possible. A uh, couple preliminary questions. Uh, Travis, you indicated that loan products are taking up an increasing amount of the market share against um, third-party ownership models. Do, it, will there ever be a, a point where consumer-owned systems represent a majority of the total installations? That's that's the first part of the question. It's a two-part question. And are people currently doing more leases or PPAs? Which of those is, is the more popular model? Okay, so um, start with the first one. And I always get myself into trouble with these, these kind of crystal ball questions, so I'll, I'll do my best. But um, I would say that the uptake of loans depends on various factors. A big one is uh, the, um, the personal ITC. So right now homeowners can receive the ITC which has enabled this, um, this solar loan marketplace. But um, as, the, um, as the ITC ramps down, I'm actually not sure, and, and it would be good to clarify, if the personal ITC ramps down with the corporate ITC, the business ITC, or if it goes away entirely in 2020. Um, if that's the case, then I would, I would imagine that these loans would probably drop off um, and people would transition back to third-party products just based on cost. Um, there are other factors, you know, do, do you have to take on O&M um, if you own the system? Do you want that responsibility? Some people do. Some people don't think it's any more complicated than dealing with a car, servicing a car. But again, there's risk associated with that, right? If you have a major problem with your solar system and you can't get it covered by warranty, what's your out-of-pocket cost? And, um, you know, and would you have gotten a better deal with a, with a TPO product? Some loan products do um, actually offer, or they did at one point when, we, when they were first coming out, a care package, right, like an O&M package and, and uh, performance guarantees and things like that. They were a bit more costly, uh, but they were folded in. Um, so there's that option as well. 
Um, in terms of where they go, I would say that in general, um, if if the economic trend stays consistent, that you will you will see more loans gain market share. But these TPO products are so well known by right now that they they certainly have the advantage. Um, and uh, it depends on how they're marketed and and who's out in in the marketplace uh, selling these things. Right? Like if uh, it makes more sense for a company to push its third-party products, then they might stick with those. Um, in terms of what they lead with to consumers. Uh, the second question was um, more leases or PPAs. I have not seen research on this recently, um, but my impression was as of a year ago or so that PPAs were the, the more dominant product in the TPO space. I'm not sure if that's current information or not, but that's, that's something I did hear um, sort of uh, just in the conference chatter a year or two ago. Great, thanks. Uh, another question. So, um, you know, I know there's public templates available for for leases and PPAs. Are there any public templates available for loan products? So that's an interesting question. That's something we got behind a couple of years ago when we were working with the industry on doing these standard contracts. NREL was very interested in producing a standard loan document, um, and the the effort kind of fizzled. For one uh, thing. Uh, we were told consistently that uh, loan docs, um, there's not much magic to them, and they uh, they are institution specific usually, right? Um, the so it's not the document itself that's so much the um, the that needs standardization. It was more the underwriting process. Um, so we we got to work on an underwriting process, but it turned out there that most of the the stuff was pretty consistent anyway across underwriters. Um, you know, this has been going on for a long time, um, underwriting consumers for various types of assets, um, or, or, you know, to lend out to consumers for various types of assets. And um, oftentimes the technology risk wasn't so much a factor. It was more just the basic uh, determining uh, FICO, determining bankruptcy history, determining, you know, debt to income, all these sorts of things that we, we uh, traditionally look at. Um, and uh, another thing that uh, underwriters were considering in the solar case specifically was savings they were getting on top of, um, you know, if, if you were to underwrite them or, or, or issue a loan, um, what kind of savings relative to the, their electricity bill are you getting there? And the bigger the savings, obviously, the more favorable the loan and the more you could, you could notch down that interest rate. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we kind of abandoned that effort, too, because, again, we were we were discovering that there's just there's not a whole lot of secret sauce. Um, we did end up uh, producing a standard loan doc um, that was to be made available. Um, I don't know if it ever got published, but if you go to the same site as the standard lease and PPA that I list on the slides there, it'll be posted there if it's posted anywhere. Um, it might still be in process. It kind of got held up in a purgatory of, of um, processing, but. Uh, I would check there to see if it's available. Thanks. Uh, another question: Why why haven't big banks like Bank of America, Citibank, Chase developed products for solar like they have for for cars? Do you have an answer for that? Sure. My impression is um, that, and th this comes from speaking directly with some of the banks. Um, this isn't sort of corroborated by um, external research or anything, but I don't know if there is any. So. <clears throat> My impression is that the terms that were uh, required to be offered when these loan products were um, were developed were, were coming onto the marketplace were kind of unfavorable to banks. These you know longer term, ten to twenty year loans um, going out that far doesn't uh, make sense for a lot of banks uh, as regulations have gotten a bit tighter as the U.S. has implemented Basel III, um, as Dodd Frank has come into effect. Um, and uh, their capital requirements have sort of uh, ratcheted up. Um, going out long distance um, on a technology that at the time uh, wasn't terribly well understood was not something most of them were comfortable with. Um, and I think at this point the marketplace is sufficiently um, uh, equipped or, or sufficiently um, supplied with uh, loans, but again, there might be a gap in terms of offering a national product, right? Sort of like a national solar loan that you know Bank of America has presence everywhere all over the world. 
Um, so I'm not I'm not really sure what the holdup is at this point. Um, and maybe it's still regulatory. Um, maybe it's uh, uh, they they figure the market's already saturated and they're waiting for their moment. Um, could be a combination of those factors. Could be things that I I'm not sure of, but. That was my impression of why they weren't getting involved at the time. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, it just didn't make sense for them. Thanks, Travis. Uh, another question. Can you give an example of what a remedy might be if, um, if a third-party owned system production guarantee isn't met? What, what would the customer's remedy in that case be? Um, this is something that you have to maybe look at the standard um, contracts to, to get for certain. But I've heard that sometimes, um, you know, it, it depends on what the basis is, right? If you're, if you're talking about a monthly basis, if you're talking about an annual basis, um, there might be a true up in terms of a, like a check that the uh, solar company cuts to the, um, <clears throat> the homeowner or um, the, uh, the system host. Um, there, if, if it's on a sort of rolling basis, that um, if there's misproduction one month, um, the next month might be uh, it might true it up that way. Um, so I think there's uh, various ways to deal with this, but um, I do believe that uh, solar companies will cut you a check um, if you hit the end of that uh, that sort of performance period, and uh, the true up reveals that you uh, you're still um, sort of in the red for production. They will actually uh, cut you the uh, the value of that production. Excellent, thanks. We're getting close to the top of the hour here, but I, I think we'll um, ask just a few more questions and we'll probably bleed over a little bit um, past the hour um, just because there's so many good questions um, that we've got. Um, along those lines, i uh, got a couple questions that relate to the, the low income, the low and moderate income market, the LMI market. Um, in one of your early slides, you showed the customer adoption curve. And so this question is, where do low income customers, you know, where do you think low income customers fall on the solar adoption? Adoption curve um, are these these financing products really making the market more accessible for the, the low-income market, or is fertile, further financial innovation necessary? And what options tend to be better for low-income customers from a from a financing standpoint, solar financing? Sure. Um, so I think it's uh, helpful in this case to differentiate between uh, low FICO and low and FICO being the credit score. Um, uh, and low to moderate income, right? Because the the one doesn't necessarily equal the other. Um, we are seeing a sort of I don't call it a race to the bottom, but we we are seeing a, a solar companies, um, and, and I mentioned Pace earlier as being able to do this. They're able to mine lower FICO scores um, to bring on on board uh, more solar customers, um, and we're seeing this just as sort of familiarity with these uh, financing products as investors get more familiar with customer performance, essentially. Uh, we're noticing that uh, um, lower FICO bands are, are being tapped. And again, PACE, because it's a tax assessment um, and is not tied to uh, um, technology performance or, or the credit performance of the customer, um, allows for uh, lower FICO mining as well. Um, low to moderate income, uh, slightly different, um, although lower FICO you know, can correlate with low to moderate income. Um, I would say that we're not quite there yet in terms of offering that demographic um, financing products that make sense for them. That chart that I showed, the adoption curve, doesn't necessarily um, uh, have a space for them. I, I, it kind of um, glosses over that demographic, if you will. So I don't know where they would fit on there. But certainly, at this point, I would say that uh, my research and the conversations I've been having with folks is that you can't necessarily offer a low to moderate income product without supporting it with some kind of public capital somehow, um, without um, you know like a, a loan loss reserve or um, or incentives. Like in California, you've got the MASH or SASH program. It used to be MASH, now it's SASH or vice versa, um, which um, goes towards alleviating the the cost of the system. Massachusetts uh, has a publicly supported loan program, which has an LMI component, which alleviates system cost. This is the way you're, you're seeing LMI being tapped now. Um, community solar is another way to do it. Um, uh, but again, I don't know if that product is there now. Uh, you would need sort of a, a specially designed uh, community solar product to be able to appeal to low to moderate income. Uh, multifamily housing, if you're, if you're uh, tackling 
solar that way, spreading uh, the benefits of solar across um, multifamily units. That's another way to do it. Um, but uh, to reiterate, reiterate for you know the fifth or sixth time, I don't think anything's there on its own. It's it's all sort of at this point um, supported by um, the public sector. Um, and uh, I uh, maybe someday these products uh, will be available, uh, you know, special LMI products. But um, right now, uh, public sector participation is is critical for for that market to develop. Thanks. Okay, maybe we'll take uh, two more questions. Um, one question has to do with uh, financing products that combine PV systems and battery chargers, either the chargers, you know, for, for electric storage or electric vehicles. Um, are there any products that you know of that, that combine those two technologies? I haven't heard of any, no. Um, certainly you can do uh, battery backup power, but um, in terms of uh, charging, um, technology that I've not um, and again while that there may be no s sort of specific um, loan product like that you can go to uh, things like your home ec line of credit or maybe if you have a relationship with your bank right these alternative financing means for technologies that may not yet be proven or there's no available specific product on the market um, I don't know if pace allows for electric charging stations or not. Um, but there will be a list if you are in a, in a pace, a residential pace area where that's available to you. Um, you go to the contractor's websites um, or sometimes the administrator's website and they'll have a whole list of technologies that are <clears throat> eligible for pace financing. You can do your research that way. So um, no specific products but maybe options out there. Thanks, Travis, and thanks for everyone for sticking with us this long. We'll just do one more question because I know we're we're over over the hour here, um, and then uh, and then we'll close out. So uh, I know there's lots of other questions too, and um, and you can see Travis's contact information there if you want to follow up with with him. Uh, question is, what happens with respect to renewable energy credits, RECs, um, for third-party owned systems, and how does that impact a homeowner's ability to to say their home is powered by clean energy? So uh, those RECs will generally go to the third party um, owner and they will um, ideally use that uh, value. They'll do sort of like a, a forward strip on them, right? They'll, they'll sell them off to a, uh, to a compliant entity that needs those RECs um, at a forward strip. It's generally discounted, um, but they will um, take that cash stream and they'll fold it into the value of your system, right? Affording the, uh, the homeowner some cost reduction uh, therewith. Um, generally, it's not the best bang for your buck for the RECs, but um, REC markets are also pretty, um, pretty tight right now. This, it's difficult to sell. Um, so um, homeowners will generally not get the RECs in a third-party owned uh, system transaction. Um, and <laughs> you, you know it, the the trouble in saying that you produce green power, right? Or you you know you have you produce renewable energy, is generally more for companies that um, are making these statements out in the public domain that you know and they're, and they're subject to lawsuits and things like that. I've never heard of a homeowner getting sued because they said they produce green power even though they don't own the RECs. Um, but technically, you can't say that. Um, you can't say that you uh, produce green power produce renewable energy, you know, produce solar energy or whatever, um, because uh, you don't own the green attributes of the system. Um, the biggest problem for homeowners, I think, is when up in a home sale. You know, can you advertise as this system produces um, green power? Uh, that's, um, that's, a, that's a gray area. You could, you could potentially get in some trouble for that. Um, I don't know who the relevant authorities would be that would come, uh, come down on you for it, but um, it is uh, it is false advertising, um, as uh, the sort of the rec um, uh, laws are, are written. So it's it's kind of a bit of a gray area, Nate. I don't know if you have more to contribute there, but uh, that's something that um, I guess falls into the consumer protection bucket. Um, recs and uh, you know if you don't own them, how can you sort of talk about your solar system? 
yeah, that that I think that covers it well for now. There are so, there is some guidance out there on some of these things, uh, green guides, as well as I know the state of Vermont has uh, has an advisory about about recs and marketing claims around that. Um, but uh, we'll leave it there for now, and and we'll use that opportunity to remind you that we will be producing further resources, educational resources on um, on these topics of uh, accessing the low and moderate income market and consumer protection um, through the Sustainable Solar Education project. I want to thank you, Travis, for your presentation. That was incredibly uh, in incredibly thorough, and uh, we really appreciate it. And I want to thank everyone for, for tuning in and for your good questions. Um, before before we wrap things up, I just want to see if you have any uh, final parting, parting remarks, Travis. Any last words? Uh, no. Again, I'd encourage you all to sort of uh, use the resources in the slides and, and, and reach out if you need uh, guidance for anything else. And thank you all for your time, and um, have a good day. Great, thanks, Travis. Thanks again. Um, I'll let uh, I'll pass it over to Samantha to to close out. Great, thanks, Nate. Thanks, Travis. Um, I just want to alert everyone to the web address on our screen: cisa.org backslash projects backslash sustainable dash solar. That's where where you'll find more resources and information related to this project. Um, Stay tuned. We have a lot of upcoming webinars this summer on topics that may be of interest to you. Uh, we will send everyone a follow-up email with a recording of the webinar and a link to the slides. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar today. We'll see you next time.